Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's, it's really nice to see all of you here, and, and uh, it's nice to be back. You know, we're going to talk a little bit about peritoneal mesothelioma, and, and forgive me, I think we'll kind of mix uh, several parts of our agenda into one sort of big conglomerate of things so that we can kind of keep the conversation dynamic. Um, you know, obviously feel free to ask questions. You know, we're hoping to make this interactive and hoping that, you know, we can, we can review some of these things together. But I think, um, you know, this is one forum where I don't need to tell most people that peritoneal mesothelioma is not pleural mesothelioma. And I think that's a very important distinction that we all need to make. And I think when we are advocating, when we are, um, you know, thinking about trials, we're thinking about new studies, it's very important to recognize the differences. We know that they are more associated with germline diseases. Uh, we know that they have very different prognosis. They respond differently to treatments. Um, and, and what we also have to be careful of is there's a lot of nihilism, you know, a lot of, lot of um, nihilism in, in the physician community, in the community in general, around how patients do with peritoneal mesothelioma. And in fact, among surgeons, because of the way peritoneal mesothelioma looks, a general surgeon that, that actually visualizes a peritoneal mesothelioma can be very overwhelmed um, and wrongly prognosticate patients. So I do think it's a very important thing for us to uh, to recognize that this is a unique disease. I think the, um, you know, the first part that I wanted to share with all of you is, is something that um, all of us as a group have been working on and several other members were not here, um, so that you get a sense of where we are trying to push in terms of increasing advocacy, awareness, and education. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about some innovative studies and trials from Dr. Nash and Dr. Blakely. And then we'll kind of go through um, new concepts in, um, in medical oncology as you think about new treatments. You've heard this morning about immunotherapy, chemotherapy, but how do they interface with peritoneal mesothelioma? I've just told you it's very different, but how do they interface? And so we'll hear that from, uh, from our medical oncologists. And then what we can do is we'll just kind of go through some basic clinical trials that are open right now, and then we'll discuss some cases, think about how do we make those decisions, and then that would be a great opportunity for all of you. If you want to ask questions, we can kind of go through that. But I think, you know, it is important to recognize that clinical trials for peritoneal mesothelioma are very limited. You are going to hear about some of the trials that are open in the United States right now. But the biggest problem we have, and you heard this, you know, in the session before lunch about radiology and CT scans and PET scans, the biggest problem is it's very hard to measure mesothelioma of the peritoneum. It's very hard to think about. So A, it's a rarer disease than pleural meso, and B, it's very hard to measure it, so it's really hard to put patients on clinical trials, and so you need a very dedicated voice. We need patient support. We need advocacy to do that. I think the other thing, like I mentioned, we don't have good education systems, so in fact, it's remarkable when we think about training of general surgeons, think, training of primary care physicians, there isn't enough in terms of what we do during their training, as well as resources that we provide them to know how to diagnose mesothelioma. I heard someone ask a question, why does it take a year to diagnose this? It's because very often we don't have awareness, even though we have the tools, we have the mechanisms for delivery, such as, you know, now you have uh, internet, you have phones, things like that. And I think the, the third thing that's very important for all of you to know is that the current treatment guidelines for a lot of these diseases don't represent all the stakeholders. Um, you know, oftentimes many of these guidelines are made well-meaning, uh, but they don't include the patient voice. They don't include, you know, physicians that actually treat those diseases. And so it is important for us to know that, recognize it, and, and push against that. So I think one of the things that uh, we've been working on as a group is we're working on bringing together physicians. This is, you know, demonstrating the power of collaboration. I think everyone across the country has been very generous. Everyone is working together. Um, and we've created this sort of consortium where MARF, um, the, the physician groups, and then professional societies such as American Society of Clinical Oncology and Society of Surgical Oncology are all kind of working together to try to create a better way of educating our trainees, a better way of creating pathways for management so we can share it with people across 
to conduct reviews, to kind of update the evidence that's there, to make standards for how we take care of these folks, and then to align across different societies, pathologists, radiologists, everyone else. So how do we align to, to improve the care? Finally, with the goal of improving research to provide clinical trials to every single one of our patients that comes through the door with peritoneal mesothelioma. And the goal, of course, is to accelerate education and research. And so this is something that, that is an effort that the leadership at MARF has been involved with as well. Um, and I invite any of you who has questions, um, you know, to certainly ask and learn more about it. So I think with that, I'm just going to um, hand this over to Dr. Nash um, to speak a little bit about the Icarus trial so you all understand uh, where this field is evolving and how challenging it is to do trials, but then how some dedicated in individuals can, can move the field here. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just have one slide, and feel free to interrupt or to ask questions. This is the clinical trial. We uh, treated the first patient on the trial just a week or so ago, and this is something we're hoping is going to open up at multiple uh, sites uh, over the coming uh, months. So basically, uh, these are for treatment-naive patients, so patients who have not had any treatment for mesothelioma, so new diagnoses. If it appears resectable based on the preoperative assessment, they can consent to the protocol at that point and if they uh, go to the OR and if they can achieve an optimal site of reduction, then they receive IPEC with mitomycin C and then they're randomized, and this is the question we're trying to answer, they're randomized to getting the same two drugs, uh, same doses, uh, which is cisplatin and pemetrexid, uh, or carboplatin uh, can be substituted as needed. And they get it either intravenously, uh, sort of the conventional way that most people here would be familiar with, as well as then they get it intraperitoneal. So instead of a port being placed intravascularly, they have a port placed in the abdomen at the time of surgery, and then they could be administered in an outpatient setting, uh, the chemo treatments. Um, if, on the other hand, so that's, those are the patients who are apparently resectable. Uh, if it's unclear if the surgeon is uncertain the extent of disease and whether they're amenable to an optimal site of reduction from the start, they can be taken for diagnostic laparoscopy. Also, if the diagnosis is unclear, uh, you can just get it proven on frozen section before the surgery, but we prefer to, you know, be sure about it, obviously, because frozen section isn't 100 percent reliable. So uh, uh, if the diagnosis is unclear or if it's uncertain that, that the disease is resectable, then they can be taken for diagnostic laparoscopy with biopsies as needed. If they appear resectable then, then they go down the left side of the screen there, go to surgery, get the cell reduction and the chemo. If, on the other hand, they're determined to be unresectable, uh, then they go to systemic chemotherapy uh, and, and potentially are still a candidate for surgery, but they're not a candidate for the protocol at that point uh, because we need treatment naive because the whole question is here is does the treatment work? So you can't give it before you even ask the question. So, uh, uh, so if they respond, you may go back for diagnostic laparoscopy to confirm they're resectable and still can treat them, but they just won't be on protocol. If they don't respond to first-line chemo, then uh, second-line or alternative clinical trial. So that's uh, the basic structure. It's designed for about 60 patients, and this is a phase two trial, so we're looking for a signal of efficacy. Uh, we don't necessarily expect to prove the difference, but at least to get a sense of the relative efficacy of these two approaches to see if they're equivalent or one may be better than the other or less toxic than the other. So if anyone has any questions about this protocol, I'm happy to take any questions now or, or later. Actually, with, with a show of hands, could we see how many uh, of you in the audience have either personally been affected or have family members, caregivers uh, of peritoneal mesothelioma? Okay. Good. So I think, you know, hopefully most of you also understand the terminology. I know it was gone through in the morning, uh, but cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC is the standard of care for patients with peritoneal mesothelioma. And I think this, this approach is very novel in, in the sense of delivering intraperitoneal chemotherapy uh, in addition to the HIPEC. And so I think um, we can either take questions now or maybe later, but if anyone has any questions or comments. Okay, great. I think next we'll have Dr. Blakely just discuss another new idea.
for taking care of patients with peritoneal mesothelioma. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me to present. And I really want to thank the patients, families, and my team here uh, for being here because I think that organizations like MARF are critically important for linking up patients, families, and providers. Uh, without groups like this, a lot of patients would never come to meet us. So thank you. Um, our clinical trial at the NIH uh, is trying to move towards individualizing peritoneal therapy for the patient. And I, I'm not going to say personalizing quite yet, just because I don't think we're there at this very moment, but this is moving in that direction. So there's various histologies included in this trial, but uh, I hope it shows up as bolded, the peritoneal mesothelioma histology. Um, so one of the issues that we face is that if we focus on any one component of the tumor microenvironment or where the cancer cells are on the lining of the peritoneum, this is an image from a diagnosed laparoscopy, you know, there are tumor cells, but then there are also a lot of other things around it. And there's other types of cells, there's other structures, there's extracellular matrix, there's immune cells, and really that entire environment impacts a patient's response to treatment and how best to approach removing and, uh, those cancer cells and then keeping it at bay. Um, ideally, the model is going to recapitulate what is actually happening within the patient. So it preserves that 3D architecture. It has the patient's own immune cells, the intact matrix, physiologic conditions, and is a platform by which we can introduce drugs and evaluate the response to those drugs, which ideally would then mirror what would happen in the patient him or herself. And what we do in the OR is when we strip the peritoneum that has mesothelioma involved is we actually take that, we process it, and we put it on these platforms, as you can see here with these tumor nodules on these um, pieces of peritoneum. And then this goes into a system in the lab that we can then study. And we can keep this alive for up to four days. We found that keeping it alive up to about two days is, a, is, is reliable enough to preserve the, uh, that physiologic condition and facilitate testing over time. So what we do on the protocol is we randomize patients to one of two, I would say, equivalent regimens of either intraperitoneal cisplatin with doxorubicin or cisplatin with mitomycin. We haven't had, of course, a randomized large phase three clinical trial to say which one of these is better, but uh, when we look at large respective databases, a lot of times we see that cisplatin with another agent is quite effective compared to other regimens. At the time of the site reduction, we take some of these peritoneal nodules prior to administering the HIPEC, and out in the lab, we simulate the HIPEC. And so we expose the patient's tissue to both regimens. So if somebody is randomized to cisplatin doxorubicin, their tissue is exposed in one system to cisplatin doxorubicin, and in another system, cisplatin and mitomycin. And then we administer the HIPEC to the patient in the operating room, and right after the HIPEC, we've left one piece of diaphragm to be exposed to the HIPEC itself. Right afterwards, we remove that, and we put that in a different system to then say that this is the portion of the peritoneal mesothelioma that's been exposed to the HIPEC with physiologic in vivo conditions. Uh, and then we also have a piece of tissue that's been not exposed to any chemotherapy as a control. So we have these four tissue samples overall. And what we're looking for is do we see a differential effect of the two regimens in the ex vivo systems? And have we effectively mirrored what happened in the patient with our system in the lab? And if we can show that this is reliably replicated in the system, then the next step would be towards a more personalized HIPEC to say at the time of laparoscopy, we could harvest some of this peritoneal tissue, put it in the platform, test it against two or three or four different regimens, see which one of them might be most effective for that patient, and then at the subsequent site reduction in HIPEC, use that regimen and follow that patient out and see how that, how that patient does in terms of recurrence-free and overall survival. So that would be the next level trial that would be justified through what we're studying right now on this trial. So with that, I think we'll go to other clinical trials that are available. Um, but we have to take any questions about that later. <laughs>
So I think, you know, I, I, you know obviously we've, we've kind of started off with just speaking a little bit um, about how we think about peritoneal mesothelioma. And I think as we start hearing more about, you know, chemotherapy options, immunotherapy options, um, I think it'll all kind of tie in nicely when we start thinking about uh, our case studies. But I think I just wanted to give you all a flavor of what are the ongoing clinical trials that are specific to peritoneal mesothelioma. Now, there are some basket trials. There will be other types of studies, and, and hopefully you'll hear more about them where patients can be included. But specific to um, trial uh, peritoneal mesothelioma, I think the trials uh, that are open is the trial that you just heard from uh, Dr. Nash, um, the intraperitoneal paclitaxel group, and this is for patients with resectable peritoneal mesothelioma. So they have surgery, and then you get an additional dose of intraperitoneal chemo. We had a clinical trial open in Chicago when I was at the University of Chicago, where we said, let's give patients immunotherapy before we did surgery in the setting of resectable peritoneal mesothelioma. And uh, we actually stopped our trial after accruing our first two patients, uh, because both of our patients had uh, essentially very significant renal toxicity, which was a very remarkable sort of never before reported. And we had other trials where we've done uh, combination uh, immunotherapy for peritoneal mesothelioma, and we had never seen this type of effects where their kidneys really got affected. And then when we did surgery, then again their kidneys got affected. So it was a very dramatic sort of a, a finding, and, and we're reporting that soon. So currently that trial is, is not open. And then the Alliance study, which is looking at a combination of chemo plus immunotherapy for patients who have a resectable peritoneal mesothelioma. So this, the Alliance study has two arms, one where you have chemo and immunotherapy and one where you don't. And then you have other unresectable trials, and, and I don't want to steal the thunder of, uh, of my colleagues coming up right now, but there are a, a few trials that are open looking at different targets, whether it's the EGFR um, target using the drug erlotinib. Um, again, another trial for intraperitoneal paclitaxel in the Netherlands um, and uh, other similar trials. But I think what is interesting and many patients will ask often is about PIPEC. Um, and so PIPEC is the delivery of intraperitoneal chemotherapy in an aerosolized form. And we know that HIPEC essentially delivers chemotherapy. It's inside a solution. It's placed in the abdomen. It's circulated for about 90 minutes, and it kind of distributes the drug. But I think the, the drawback is sometimes across adhesions and, and barriers. Sometimes the chemo may not distribute as well. So the theory was, what if you aerosolize the chemotherapy, put it in the belly, and let it kind of spray everywhere? Um, and that technology is called PIPEC. And this is now slowly coming to the United States. It's been in Europe and Asia for a long time. Um, but the trial that is being done in the French group is called the MESOTIP trial, in which they're basically doing four cycles of this intraperitoneal PIPEC, uh, along with systemic chemotherapy, to see if it makes a difference compared to just systemic chemotherapy alone for patients with resectable, uh, unresectable uh, mesothelioma. So this is another sort of an interesting space where you know new technologies are being applied to study uh, peritoneal mesothelioma, but also a very good example of where groups have gotten together, advocated for it, and now they're able to do randomized trials in in a fairly you know uncommon disease. So I think this is sort of a, a good model for us to think about in the U.S. as well. So I think with that, I'll, I'll invite uh, both of you to, uh, to come speak a little bit about systemic therapy options, and then we'll go into some cases and discuss, and hopefully we'll have a lively discussion. All right, so we'll be discussing some of the non-surgical management um, of malignant peritoneal mesothelioma, which we'll just call peritoneal mesothelioma. Um, so in general, um, most trials and clinical annotations and discussions is about pleural mesothelioma, which is me um, the cancer around the lining of the lung, but this is more of a cancer of the lining of the abdomen. Um, other uh, issues that can occur in the abdomen as well um, can be a testicular mesothelioma, pericardial mesothelioma is also possible in the chest. We're not gonna talk about those today, but a lot of the time, the data we have, the way we treat these, it's kind of relegated to extrapolation and inference. 
from pleural disease. So I do think it's super important that we identify peritoneal mesothelioma as a separate disease state, do studies in it as such, and look at outcomes in it as such. Um, here is just kind of the ways in which when, you know, you do a quick census how people present, and they can be quite vague. Um, it can be abdominal distension, abdominal pain, um, increased abdominal girth, people saying like, you know, their pants are tighter than they expect, but they don't feel like they're gaining weight. Um, you can also at times have disease both in the belly and the chest. So that's kind of colloquially called dual compartment, meaning both spaces can be involved. Um, and that kind of in and of itself is a we treat that as a kind of more spread problem where surgery is usually not discussed. Um, I, I like this here. This is a paper we did, but there's several papers out there kind of asking the question, should peritoneal be considered the same as plural? Clinically, it's different, and genomically and pathologically, it's different. Um, and so the more we learn about this disease, we learn that the biological underpinnings of it are different, and so we can't just assume treatment outcomes will be the same. Um, so not to go too deep into the details here, but I liked just including some of this because we're talking a lot today about interventions, but I think it's also important to talk about diagnostic workup um, and like how do you get all the information you need to make the right decision. Um, the first step to that is obviously good imaging, interdisciplinary discussions, medical oncology, surgical oncology, deciding if surgery is right for you and when if it is, um, but also learning a bit more about, you know, what makes the tumor itself tick. So in peritoneal mesothelioma, unlike pleural mesothelioma, the guidelines actually say there's a specific gene that could be actionable. It's rare, but ALK, which we talk more about in lung cancer, but we can find ALK fusions in peritoneal meso, so it's always something that should be looked for. And similar to pleural, peritoneal meso guidelines would say we should do full genomic testing if there's available tissue, because that helps look for ALK, it helps look for some other rare fusions I won't go into, but it can also help open up ideas about clinical trials. Um, the other thing at the bottom here, this is inherited genetic testing. Um, I don't think I, the point, there it is. Um, so we also do recommend doing inherited or germline testing for all people that are interested. Similar to mesothelioma in the lining of the lung, if it's in the abdomen, there's also about a 10 to 15 percent chance of inherited predisposition to cancers. Whether or whether, whether or whether or not there was a concern for asbestos exposure, it's still something we would advocate be considered if the family's interested in knowing that information. Um, so I put this slide up just to kind of exemplify how far we've come in the last year or so. Peritoneal mesothelioma never had its own distinct guideline, let alone a consortium discussing the right ways in which to explore and expose the population to those guidelines. So we now actually have in black and white in the NCCN, which is our kind of large consortium, a separate way in which we should be considering treating the disease, which talks to the fact that it is a separate disease state. I put this up here just to start the conversation about systemic therapy as opposed to going through hundreds of trials and you know some that were good and some that didn't work out so well. This is kind of the way in which we would consider treating people's standard of care with many nuances. Um, my colleague will be going over immunotherapy in a few moments, so I'm gonna focus a bit more on the chemotherapy. Um, so in mesothelioma in general, a lot of that data I'm going to be talking about here is kind of taken from plural. Now some of those um, studies did allow peritoneal patients on, however this, there was a much lower percent of patients with that type of disease on those trials. Um, so for the most part we would consider standard of care as we would in plural to either be a combination chemotherapy regimen or most of the time a combination immune therapy regimen. There was a recent trial looking at a combo chemo plus immunotherapy together, but that's not in the guidelines yet for plural, and we don't really know if there's going to be uptake in peritoneal. Um, for IV chemo, which is what I'm specifically talking to now, um, we would consider platinum and pemetrexid, also called Olympta, to be a standard option. You can add a third drug to that called Avastin. That's an antibody against blood vessel formation, trying to starve the tumor of blood flow. Um, the other options of immune therapy, again, we're extrapolating from the plural disease, but we ask ourselves the question, you know, what's the right treatment to start with for a person who can't do surgery? Chemo versus immune therapy are both options. How do you choose? A lot of that has to do with patient preference, underlying medical problems if one makes more sense than the other, and histology, what it looks like under the microscope. That can be both, you know, the type. Some people may be familiar with the word epithelioid or non-epithelioid, biphasic sarcomatoid. You can go even deeper down that rabbit hole. Within epithelioid, you can break it down further to 
solid, trabecular. There's all these fancy words that we can see in the pathology report. That gives us a bit of an inclination about maybe which one is a reasonable one to start with first. But it's always important to talk to your doctor about any concerns you have with one or the other and vice versa. Um, so again, I'm going to stick on the chemo vein and I'll, I'll kind of leave ipilimumab nivolumab to my colleague. Um, but there are other options for chemotherapy through the vein after the initial therapy may or may, stop, may, or may not benefit. Um, so I choose that word carefully because I was talking to a lovely family uh, a few moments ago. They had, uh, you know, she had platinum pemetrexid and she's a year out doing well. The question is, could I ever do it again? And the answer is, with nuance, yeah, it's a possibility. If a person's well enough and they've got a dur durable clinical benefit, which is discussing what that means is kind of a bit esoteric, but if we think they've gotten several months, six months plus of benefit, they tolerated it well, you could consider giving the same regimen again. Um, there is a limitation to how much of a certain chemo you can give before you get side effects, so it's with caution. And there are other chemos like gemcitabine, also called gemzar, people may be familiar with. Another drug which we've started using, um, ramasuramab, also called crimza. Um, Vinarelbine is another one. So these are several different IV combinations your doctor could help navigate with you. Um, and of course, clinical trials are always provocative, um, as we spoke about. Those dedicated specifically to peritoneal mesothelioma are not as common, um, but there are what we call basket trials in early phase development that allow it. And several of the plural trials don't explicitly say you can't have a different site of origin. So it's really navigating those trials with your doctor and understanding who is the best fit. With that, I'll turn it over to my colleague. So I'm going to try to help answer a few questions um, about immunotherapy and peritoneal meso. So the first question is, does it work? So let's start with um, answering, does just one immunotherapy work? So in particular, this is um, a study that um, Dr. Offen and I did together, looking back at all the people that received pembrolizumab or Keytruda. Um, and this was, um, in particular, uh, patients with peritoneal mesothelioma. Um, and you may have seen these types of plots before, but just in case you haven't, I'm just going to walk you through it for a second. Um, any line that's going down means that the tumor is shrinking. Any line that goes up means that the change from baseline, the tumor is growing a little bit. And so I've outlined here that the, those that go down the most, and that was about 21% of them, had a greater than 30% reduction in the tumor. So those are the biggest lines going down. The next group is that group plus the yellow, which is that the tumor actually didn't really change that much up or down. That's our stable disease group. Um, and it, when looking at pembrolizumab, that was about 73% of patients. So the majority had some clinical benefit. They either had good shrinkage or stable disease. And then there were 26%, so about a quarter of patients that did have growth that was 20% or more. Um, and then the, the spider plot on the right is actually just kind of a representation at each time point, that's each line represents a patient and how their disease, how the tumor either grew or shrunk. So going down, lines that go down means it's shrinking, lines that stay kind of the same means stable disease and going up means that it's growing. So in general, there was benefit for pembrolizumab. There's people that got tumor shrinkage as well as stable disease. So is two better than one? What about combination immunotherapies? So this again is another look back at patients, you know, in the real world treated, um, uh, this was one center, this is treated at MD Anderson. There, there were 20 patients that received the combination ipilimumab and nivolumab, and there were nine patients that had a single immunotherapy, so just one of those drugs. Um, and again, here I've shown you those lines. So we see actually something pretty similar. So 19% had that really nice reduction in tumor size of greater than 30%. And then you see the 65% had about either stable disease or um, a reduction. And then you do see another, um, you know, another small group that had tumor growth. When you look at side effects, because I think that's one of the questions that comes to mind, you say, well, if you're giving me two immunotherapies versus one, you know, is that going to be more toxic for me? And on paper, there is a higher risk of some of the um, side effects from immunotherapy. But for many of you that are familiar with immunotherapy, the toxicity is really not predictable. So some people have very few side effects from immunotherapy, and some have, um, you know, quite a few. And it can happen at any point. 
but in general, there was no, dif no significant difference between outcomes, either whether you got two immunotherapies or one immunotherapy. So what about, we've talked about one immunotherapy, we've talked about double immunotherapy. How about if we add something besides immunotherapy to the, to the one agent? So this is immunotherapy plus. Um, and this is a trial actually that was done prospectively, so that means that patients signed consent to be treated with this combination in peritoneal mesothelioma alone. And this is a pretty, a fairly recent <laughs> trial. So not part of a bigger trial, this was just you know, for, for peritoneal meso. So it was about 20 patients. Um, the drugs that were used were atezolizumab, which is similar to the other immunotherapies that we've been talking about, and then bevacizumab, which is a drug that um, targets VEGF. And I just put a little schematic here in case, um, in case VEGF hasn't been talked about a little bit. Um, here where you see the food truck, the tumor sends off signals calling the food truck to it. So it, want, it needs food in order to grow. It's saying, feed me, and that signal is VEGF. Um, if you give an anti-VEGF agent, you shut down that feed me signal, and the food truck can no longer arrive to the tumor, and hopefully the tumor shrinks. Um, so here we have, um, you know, the lines that are going down again are those in red and yellow. And here we have about 40% of um, tumors that shrunk 30% or more. So a, a little bit better, actually, than what we saw um, with single agent or double agent immunotherapy. I will say the one caveat to that is this was a prospective clinical trial where there are lots of enrollment criteria. And the other two um, studies that I showed you were retrospective, meaning that they just looked at what happened to patients in the real world. So we know that patients that are on clinical trials, there are a lot of monitoring parameters. They may, um, outcomes may be different. They may react differently than what happens in the real world when people have other you know, medical problems going on as well. So um, immunotherapy in a nutshell. Um, it's active in fighting peritoneal mesothelioma. Um, both single and double immunotherapies have similar efficacy, and the addition of something like anti-VEGF um, may be particularly beneficial. And a bonus was that trial was done in peritoneal mesothelioma, so we have extra assurance that you know, it, could, it could really help people um, with peritoneal meso. Um, just a few kind of... Um, moments on supportive care in peritoneal meso and how it might differ from supportive care in plural. Um, so this is kind of an, um, a nice schematic of all of the types of things that could be involved in supporting a patient that is undergoing cancer treatment. Um, for you know, patients with peritoneal mesothelioma, fertility preservation, for example, and patients that are quite young, you know, some of these surgeries, high pack, they can um, you know, reduce fertility. Um, support groups, obviously, for patients and caregivers are crucial to both, um, you know, families and caregivers of patients with peritoneal and pleural mesothelioma. Um, this is a rare cancer. I think you guys have probably more stories um, than I do about navigating the financial issues with trying to get treatment approved in a rare cancer where there are very few FDA approvals and we have to go on small trials and trying to explain that to insurance companies is very challenging. Um, and then for peritoneal meso, there are, you know, nutritional services are particularly important because there may be complications from surgeries or times when it's more difficult to eat um, that we really um, do, need, do need their help. Um, so what, is it, what does living with peritoneal meso look like? Again, lots of people in this room could tell me a lot more, but um, really no two patients have the same treatment course, um, and that depends on there are different histologies, epithelioid, sarcomatoid, biphasic. There are different extensive extents of disease. The disease can, um, you can have a lot of disease or very little. And the location, if it's in a bad location that can't be resected, that's very different than um, disease that is easily resectable. Um, and although the disease is not curable, many patients can have sequential surgeries and non-surgical therapies over years and years um, that can keep things under control. Um, others, unfortunately, may have disease that's more resistant, um, and that's why this is such a heterogeneous group of people. 
Um, there's a lot of data that's extrapolated from pleural mesothelioma. Many people have talked about that. Um, but there are clinical trials, as um, we've mentioned, that are specifically looking at peritoneal mesothelioma. And so it's really important um, that we support those so that we can move the field forward. Um, and then lastly, you know, being seen at a center that sees um, this disease, um, and in particular surgeons that do this type of surgery a lot, is, um, is also critical to, this, um, to treating this disease. Thank you. Do we? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Questions? Do we have any questions in the room? I have a, I have a question from um, the chat and then we can come to you. Um, I have meso in, bo uh, in both pleural and peritoneal. Uh, the doctor made the assumption the source was pleural that metastasized to the peritoneal, so we never biopsied the peritoneal. Do you think we sold ourselves short by not biopsying the peritoneal? Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, maybe I'll ask the panel to also speak about this, and maybe I'll start with Dr. Offen. So how, in your mind, do you approach someone who, say, has pleural mesothelioma? And let's do this in two settings. So one where there's initial diagnosis of what looks like bicavitary mesothelioma, meaning both in the pleural and in the peritoneum. And then how do you think about someone who's been treated for pleural mesothelioma and then has something show up in the peritoneum? And, and finally, what would you do, and maybe we can go around the panel, and finally, what would you do when someone has been diagnosed with peritoneal treated and then is diagnosed in the pleura? So maybe let's look at the three options. So in general, it it's, can be difficult at initial presentation if a person comes with issues both above and below the diaphragm. Um, a lot of the time, we have to kind of take a look and see where the dominant disease is, if there's a lot more bulky disease in one area than the other. But it's really hard to say. And to the specific question uh, in the chat, I don't, without knowing the full story, it's kind of hard to fully comment. But if, when somebody's diagnosed, it's in both the chest and the belly, for the most part, uh, never to speak for a surgeon, that makes surgery much less likely to be considered if it's involving both compartments. And so the treatment, again, knowing that pleural and peritoneal are somewhat similar you're probably still on a reasonably good path. And I could say clinically, if a person comes in, one site's biopsied, it makes sense that both sites are involved based on the picture. If somebody needs treatment, then they move forward with treatment. Um, so I just wanted to say that to answer that question first. Um, if for a person, maybe I'll answer the first part of it. Uh, if somebody presented with pleural disease to begin with and the abdomen looked clear, um, depending on the institution, sometimes people will actually take a look with a laparoscopy to take a look at the abdomen. Otherwise, it's just a really good cross-sectional imaging. Um, we would treat the pleural disease as, you know, our, my colleagues this morning talked about. Surgery may or may not be considered with a lot of nuances. And then medication therapy. If somebody had a really good response there and then later noted to have progression in the abdomen, in that setting, if it's the only site that had an abnormality and it was new, we would tend to consider sampling it if it was safe to do so to make sure we're dealing with the same problem. I wouldn't make the assumption, like common things are common, if somebody had pleural mesothelioma and let's say it was a male and they were 60, 70 years old and now they have a new spot in a lymph node in the groin, I'm not going to assume it's peritoneal meso until I actually can look at it under a microscope and prove it's not something more common like prostate or something else. Um, so first confirm the diagnosis and then you know, usually in that setting we would have a discussion probably wouldn't be surgical, but again, there's a lot of nuances, and I think the most important thing to say out loud is we are only as good as our colleagues at our institutions. So when I meet a person, it's not my job to assume surgery doesn't make sense. And the amount of times I email Dr. Nash and I'm just like, I'm seeing a patient today, I don't think they need to see you, but what do you think? Like, that's the way we operate. It's to make sure that we're exploring these avenues for you. So if somebody had a new spot, and it was only one spot, I would talk to my colleague to see does it make sense for a consult, um, and then I would move forward from there. Great. I, I think, Dr. Blakely, you have the mic. So maybe yeah. speak to me of how you think about um, peritoneal spreading to the pleura, and then in this diagnostic situation, do you offer patients diagnostic laparoscopy if it's pleura potentially spread to the peritoneum? So I was going to take a step back, and in this setting, 
I think that whenever somebody presents with bi or tri compartmental disease, the importance of genetic testing cannot be overstated. If somebody has a germline BAP1 mutation, I would reclassify that patient as having two primaries. I don't know if medical oncologists would agree with that, but we've had a couple of patients in our practice who we have reclassified as having pleural mesothelium, a metastatic to the peritoneum, or vice versa, as having primary pleural and primary peritoneal. And in the setting of a, of a germline BAP1 mutation, we would treat the compartment sequentially, starting with the dominant one. And that's where, in that setting, it would probably be rational, even if one chest doesn't have apparent disease radiographically, to put a lapar to do a laparoscopy and bilateral thoracoscopies and stage all three compartments. That, and, and seeing, having seen that clinically and having seen when folks are coming in from other centers and not having that sort of uh, approach, that's one immediate thing we can improve with care. I think when we're looking at somebody who has BAP1 germline uh, wild type, where it was a clear um, pleural primary that has gone to the peritoneum, it depends. In that setting, then it is metastatic. And it, it, at that point, it's very much personalized to what can we achieve with surgery and how can we improve that patient's quality of life at the same time as trying to optimize control of disease. And so in some circumstances, it might make sense, especially if somebody has ascites that's refractory to systemic treatment, and they're very symptomatic from that. Sometimes a, we would probably call it palliative debulking and HIPEC may help with symptom control. So there are going to be certain situations. And then on the flip side, when patients have a primary peritoneal and then pleural involvement, that's likely from direct seeding because those patients I've seen have frequently had a prior site reduction of HIPEC. It's not uncommon for us to end up violating the diaphragm from the abdominal side and probably have direct extension of tumor cells into the chest. Um, but again, that's going to come down to systemic control and potentially thoracotomy and decortication in order to control the chest that is secondarily involved. I think, you know, and, and I'd love to hear the other panelists' thought as well, but just to kind of summarize big picture, um, you know, maybe how to think about this. If someone has cancer that is in both, if mesothelioma is in e either a chest and abdomen or chest abdomen on both sides of the chest, I think it is critical, and just to reiterate and emphasize Dr. Blakely's point, it's critical to make sure that we're testing these patients for germline disease. So BAP1 mutated tumors will have a very diffuse appearance. So you see very small nodules that are across the entire peritoneum. And in fact, if you look at even normal peritoneum and you look at it under the microscope, you'll see mesothelioma in there, not infrequently. So it's actually a very remarkable disease. It is sensitive to platinum chemotherapy, but at the same time, these patients do remarkably well, even with bicavitary disease. So you can, like Dr. Blakely said, you can clean the abdomen, then the chest, then the other side. And despite doing multiple surgeries, patients can actually live very long. Um, this is very different than when the cancer starts in the pleura and is a classic pleural mesothelioma and then subsequently develops a peritoneal uh, occur, you know, metastasis or recurrence or whatever. Um, in those situations, the prognosis is much more different. It's a much more serious disease. And then I think to Dr. Offen's point, making sure you're diagnosing it appropriately, biopsying it, I think is critical. And then thinking about trials or chemotherapy or immunotherapy as appropriate makes sense. Not very often do we offer those patients surgery. And then finally, if it's in the peritoneum and dominantly in the peritoneum and then has spread to the chest as a subsequent occurrence after they've had surgery for the abdomen, it is quite often because of violation of one of the planes. So I think that's, those are sort of three critical points. They all have different meanings uh, when we think about these patients clinically. I don't know if uh, either of you have any comments to add. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of comments. I, I will say that <clears throat> not all chest disease that shows up after abdominal surgery is related to the surgery. A lot of times, the reason why we had to violate the diaphragm is because the disease was growing, growing through the diaphragm at the time of surgery. Oh, 
I, maybe not close enough. I'm just saying that the, the spread might have happened even before the surgery at a microscopic level uh, because often the patients who I've seen who get subsequent pleural disease after abdominal disease, they had a lot of diaphragm involvement and there was probably some transmission through the chest. And we, we've seen that in other peritoneal malignancies like colon cancer, ovarian cancer, appendix cancer, that it can happen completely independent of the surgery, but temporally appears to be related to surgery, but in fact it happened before. Um, the other thing I'll say about biopsies, the most important question to ask when deciding if you need another biopsy is, will it change management, right? So you don't want to go through, any biopsy is an invasive procedure, and though for the most part they're outpatient, relatively safe procedures in most contexts, there's always some risk. Um, so, you know, it, it has to somehow change management. So one of the common situations I see is where we don't biopsy is when someone has bulky abdominal disease may or may not be amenable to surgery, but they have then small lymph nodes in the chest that are indeterminate. And a lot of times that creates a lot of anxiety, what are these? But ultimately, if it's the disease in the abdomen in those situations is what's going to drive the outcome. And we somewhat disregard small things in the chest, knowing that they're going to be getting chemo and they're going to be uh, um, treating the disease wherever it is in the body. There may be some differences in response, but essentially you'd be picking the same drugs anyhow in most cases. So, um, so, so often we, you know, just treat them. Sometimes they go away, sometimes they're stable, sometimes they get bigger, but that tells you a lot about what's happening just by monitoring their behavior. But again, for the most part, patients with bulky abdominal disease, that's going to be the driving factor throughout the course of their disease, even if they do have some small component to the chest. So a little different than the patients of extensive disease, or quite different from the patients of extensive disease in the chest, but small amounts of disease in the chest, sometimes we, we just sort of treat incidentally and not become the center of the, of the treatment. Great. Um, are there any other questions? Otherwise, we can kind of um, go ahead. I have one, just one thing to add while... Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, that no, that's okay. The, while you're um, walking over is, um, you know, I think about the, about the role of surgery in peritoneal mesothelioma is really important. And if you're able to get surgery, that's, you know, one of the key parts of treatment. And I think now in pleural mesothelioma, we're just not as sure that it's the same, it's as important as it is in peritoneal. So thinking about disease that's in both the pleura and the peritoneum, you know, there is a different weight placed on whether surgery is done or not. Yeah, good point. Um, my question is to you. Um, your presentation, in, it, there's a sentence in your presentation that said peritoneal is not curable. And I just need to understand what that means, because with other cancers we hear after five years, 10 years you're con of NED, you're considered a cure. Um, I'm 10 years NED, and my doctor keeps saying, I think we can use the word cure. And I said, no, the, the texts say no. <laughs> can you explain what, how you define cure or not with this disease? Yeah, I think that's a really um, good question and a difficult question to answer, actually. Um, and it's something also that we are running into in other cancers that treatment is becoming you know, more and more effective for. Um, you know, I would say in the breast cancer world, they use the word cure a lot more, even though disease recurrence still happens. Um, so I think it's a little bit of this, the terminology. Um, but if the, you know, if the outcome is the same, that people are living a long time without disease coming back, I think it's just the semantics. So um, I don't know the right words to use. I usually say, um, you know, with patients, I say, controlling the disease and, you know, keeping it at bay is really the goal and trying to have long periods of time where you're not on treatment that is affecting your quality of life. Um, and if you never need another treatment again, then that's great. Um, I don't end up using the word cure with many of my patients just across the board because unfortunately I don't have a crystal ball and I don't know what's going to happen in the future, um, even in, in patients that have, you know, early stage diseases that could be curable. So um, I think it's a tricky word and, um, and I can appreciate that it, it gets confusing. I, I agree. I substitute the word with control. I think control is what we aim for. I think five years is kind of an arbitrary time point. We've, 
probably all had patients who have had stage one or two disease that have come back 10 years later. And so, you know, that, that recurrence curve probably never quite get, gets to zero, probably gets close. But um, I would be reticent to stop following anybody after just five years. And I think really it's lifelong surveillance. Um, but I think, yeah, control is a much more appropriate word. But I do want to congratulate you. I think, you know, it's a <laughs> remarkable thing. I think you're, you're a true cancer survivor. You know, it is tough to say when someone's cured. I had a patient who uh, was being followed for six or seven years after treatment, had no signs of cancer, felt great, and then very tragically died of something totally unrelated. Uh, but they did an autopsy and they found small amounts of pleural and peritoneal. We only knew she had peritoneal, we didn't know she had pleural, but they were, these were tiny amounts, never would have shown up in a scan, and we don't know what would have happened to that disease as well. You know, it's like the patients with germline BAP1 mutations, where I've seen patients where they were, had biopsies 30 years before, which was highly suspicious, but not definitive of meso, and it was, they didn't get BAP1 testing, there wasn't, that wasn't on their physician's radar, um, but they, it took 20 or 30 years before it manifested itself in some measurable way. So, you know, there's so much we don't understand, and it's a very heterogeneous disease. You know, we know people have lived for decades with this. Um, some having long periods off of treatment. So I agree, it's really tough. I mean, no one walks into their oncologist's office without thinking, can I be cured, right? That's what, and, and, and I agree that, you know, it, it, it almost becomes this buzzword, like it's all or nothing. Oh, I, I've got terminal cancer or I'm gonna be cured, right? And, and many people, it's hard to separate those two extremes. And for most patients with meso, it's very much in the middle, uh, where um, it, it, it can be hard to document how active the disease at any particular point in time. So it makes it so hard to, to call for that. So I don't want anyone to be discouraged, particularly people who are sitting here uh, you know, hoping that they will never have to face treatment again uh, uh, because there are many people who won't. And, and there are many cancers we've learned people die with, not of, right? Now, unfortunately, most mesos are more aggressive than that, but, you know, we know prostate cancer, thyroid cancer, quite a number of cancers that if you do autopsies, you find them, but they didn't harm the person. So I, I think, you know, you, you have to it's not, it's not binary, it's not all or nothing. Um, so again, you know, I agree, your, your congratulations to you and, and what a wonderful thing. And I, and I would remain optimistic. I don't think you need, I don't think this should make you fear that you're gonna die of meso one day. Uh, but you know, I, 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 it's just a very gray area. Great. Well, I think, you know, maybe, um what, what we thought we could do is, um, is maybe just think a little bit about how we evaluate patients, how do we think about um, patients a little bit, um, so that you all get an insight into how um, treating decisions are made. So maybe I'll start with both Dr. Blakely and Dr. Offen. Can you speak a little bit about how do you approach a patient that comes to your clinic uh, with a diagnosis of peritoneal mesothelioma when they're sort of at the extremes of age? So let's say they're young, like 20s to 30s, or they're much older, like in their 70s? What are things you think about? What are factors that, uh, that you, you think when you're looking at it? So, I mean, I can kind of take a, a little more perspective. I'll start with the diagnostics and things like that. Regardless of age, I always recommend um, both tumor and inherited genetic testing if the patient and their family's open to it, um, for many of the reasons we've alluded to. Um, also, somewhat regardless of age, if a person is of potential reproductive capability, I think it's important, so I'm not going to say the extreme young or the old, if a person is of reproductive capability and wants to preserve that, we always do recommend consideration at the first visit of sperm anking, egg preservation, if there's time to do these things, now's the time to have that chat. Um, again, I don't think age is a definitive predictor necessarily of surgery is a good idea or not, so I would always advocate seeing our surgeon for a collaborative discussion to see if the disease is amenable to it, to decide if it should be a multidisciplinary approach or we should start with systemic therapy. Um, I, I, those are my main points. I don't think I would determine the type of drug I give based on age. I base it more so on the extent of disease, symptoms, underlying other medical problems and labs. <laughs> 
I think all those are excellent points. I don't think there's one way to approach it. Um, certain things I take into consideration are going to be, you know, the patient's physical status coming in, um, how much ascites the patient has, and if we think we can improve ascites, improve nutritional intake, and get a patient more ready for surgery through chemotherapy. By the same token, I've had patients with peritoneal mesothelioma who have done worse with chemotherapy and did much better after surgery. And so it's, it's all individualized. Um, we find that sometimes mesothelioma, especially bulky disease, can be pretty inflammatory. And it can be something where a patient is actively losing weight and uh, really losing their strength because of the disease. And the chemotherapy can get on top of that, but sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, there's ever, and I, I agree, the extremes of age, um, I don't think there is an age range to say germline testing is more or less beneficial. I think it's across the age spectrum. We've had patients diagnosed with BAP1 mutations in their late 60s. Um, and so, you know, I think it's one of those paradoxical situations where the germline mutation actually portends more favorable biology a lot. Um, but when it gets to be pretty bulky and significant later uh, in life, it's, you know, pretty substantial. Um, but really, individualizing that is, is so critical. Great. Dr. Nash, a uh, question for you. Um, you know, when, when we think of mesothelioma, you know, obviously we're thinking of the common epithelioid mesothelioma, but are all mesotheliomas bad? Are there good mesotheliomas as well? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I don't know if there's good ones, but there's ones that are less bad for sure. I don't know we've got a good way of discriminating at diagnosis other than the well diff papillary mesos, which appear to be uh, not a true malignancy, and the majority of those, unless there's some feature that makes you suspicious that that's not fully telling you the story, that they have symptoms, bulky disease, because you can have, um, I suspect that well diff papillary meso is a precursor that for, because, and we've seen it, I've seen it in BAP1 germline mutated patients where the first thing they get is well diff papillary meso and then they ultimately develop malignant meso. Uh, so, so I think that that is a very important distinction. The patients who are asymptomatic with minimal disease and their biopsies just show well diff papillary meso, we're just watching. And uh, I don't think we've found anyone to progress to disease. There's a couple of cases, or progress to, to, to uh, you know, need treatment. Uh, there are a couple of cases in their literature of people who had well diff papillary meso who ultimately died of meso, but there's actually more cases in the literature of patients with well diff papillary meso who've died of treatment related complications and have died from the disease. So we're very careful to, to really think through these patients and make sure they're adequately sampled. Uh, so that's sort of the one very striking subgroup. But once you've documented invasive meso, which generally a, uh, like a percutaneous needle type biopsy is not sufficient. Usually you need a chunk of tissue. So usually when someone comes to me without a tissue diagnosis or an ambiguous diagnosis, I'll take them for a diagnostic laparoscopy so we can get a substantial amount of tissue and be really sure that we've nailed down the diagnosis. But there are some patients who present with absolutely no symptoms, their performance status might not be so great, or they're not very enthusiastic about treatment, and we've watched them and, and ultimately found in some patients it can take years. Um, uh, Dr. Rafa and I share a patient who recently started treatment, maybe in the last year or so, but he had six or seven years before he had any, he had very, very slow progression. So it's certainly not wrong in an asymptomatic patient who is not enthusiastic about going right to treatment uh, to, to observe them for a period and get a sense of what the pace of their disease is uh, because there is a big range and, and I don't know how to identify those patients other than based on their you know, symptoms at diagnosis. I think something else just to add again, kind of hearkening back to genetics. Um, so well differentiated papillary peritoneal mesothelial tumor um, because they're trying to differentiate it a bit now from a true mesothelioma. Looking at the genetics of these tumors, if there's equivocation, if people aren't sure, it can sometimes be helpful. There are certain genes that we find more so in well differentiated than you would in, in invasive mesothelioma. And for the most part, the proof is going to be in the biopsy and the clinical presentation. Um, another relatively rare uh, entity would be a multicystic type of disease state, which a lot of the times can just be observed or surgically managed without the need for systemic therapy. But again, these are very unique clinical presentations that a lot of time require a good biopsy.
Yeah. I think let, let, let's think a little bit about the other end of the spectrum, though. So, Dr. Marmorales, if you have a patient who comes in with, say, a biphasic or sarcomatoid peritoneal mesothelioma, um, how do you think about that? And maybe speak a little bit about how important is histological assessment when you think about peritoneal mesothelioma? Do you use just grade? Are you using just you know, like we heard before, the trabecular formation, deciduite, form, deciduite formations, are you using KI-67? How do you think about how aggressive a disease is? And maybe also if you could speak a little bit about when you see someone with sarcomatoid peritoneal only mesothelioma, um, how do you approach the first line of treatment there? Yeah, so I, th I think this is actually something that peritoneal and pleural share. Um, so we're now starting to think about the histology as guiding treatment. So um, in peritoneal mesothelioma, if I see someone that has biphasic or sarcomatoid peritoneal mesothelioma, I'm, for the most part, not considering a surgical approach. Um, sometimes for those with biphasic, which is a mix of epithelioid and sarcomatoid, with low volume of disease, we would consider surgery. But um, I'm starting to think about systemic therapies a little bit more seriously, especially in those with symptoms. Um, and just like in pleural mesothelioma, we're borrowing some of their data where they actually looked at chemotherapy versus immunotherapy um, and saw that those that had biphasic or sarcomatoid histology did much better if they got immunotherapy. And so we've borrowed that in peritoneal mesothelioma as well. And so patients that have biphasic or sarcomatoid, I would start with immunotherapy first. Yeah. Um, I'm going to keep asking questions, but if any of you have questions in the middle, you know, feel free to just raise your hand, and I'm absolutely happy to stop and take your question. Um, but I think, I guess the question for the surgeons, we heard that, you know, surgery, cytoreductive surgery is critical in the management of patients with peritoneal mesothelioma. Um, and so maybe Dr. Nash and, and Blakely, can you um, share how do you make decisions about what is considered resectable? And so we all know there's a score called the PCI score, which maps the abdomen into 13 zones. It gives a score of 0 to 3 in each of the zones. So the score can go from 0 to 39. And because mesothelioma is a disease of the peritoneum, it's not uncommon for us to look inside and see a ton of mesothelioma all over. And so the question is, do you use PCI score as a cutoff, or is it more the distribution or the ability for you to do surgery uh, or a combination of factors? And how do, you, how do you decide if someone is resectable or not? Yeah, it's definitely a combination of factors. Um, you sort of have to match the extent of the disease with the patient's performance status. Um, you know, there are some patients who come who I think would be able to undergo a uh, operation, sorry, Normally my voice is not a problem. I don't know why I'm having difficulty today, but um, so so the um, so you want to match. If someone has extensive disease, they need to be very fit, um, and and you also need to factor in. While age is to me not a absolute contraindication, you have to factor in what would happen to this individual and their quality of life if they had a major complication. Uh, you know, someone who is 30, 40, even 50 years old is going to tolerate a complication and, and get back to a functioning life again much better than someone who's in their late 70s or early 80s. Uh, even someone of that age who's very fit, I often say to them, you know, yes, I think we can do the surgery. Yes, you seem fit. But if you have a complication, your life may never be the same again. You may never, you know, return to that degree of, of, of uh, fitness or performance status. So I think... You know, you always have to think about the worst possible scenario, um, and, and that that often uh, comes in very significantly in older patients who, you know, and again, I don't think you can make absolute rules, but for the most part, younger patients want duration and older patients want quality, and that's an overgeneralization. Uh, but for the most part, I've discovered that 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 um, uh, the older a patient is, the less interested they are in undergoing a high risk surgery that might take away with quality of life. Because when you think about it in pure you know, economic terms, you're getting more bang for your buck with successful treatment at a young age uh, because you've got more years of life potentially ahead of you. So 
I think these require really, really extensive conversations with the patients. These are hour-long minimum and sometimes two office visit type conversations before committing to you know, a, a large operation. So, so I would say the performance out of the patient, the goals of the patient is also equally as critical, and then the extent of disease. The absolute contraindications are extensive bowel involvement. Um, because there's little we can do surgically if there's extensive small bowel involvement because you need at least half your small bowel to maintain nutrition. And, um, you know, uh, as most of you will know, the leading cause of death among patients with peritoneal meso is bowel failure, bowel obstruction, malnutrition. So, you know, we, we have to be very mindful about how much bowel has to be sacrificed in order to clear the disease. So PCI is important, and patients with very high PCIs, I'm obviously very concerned about how well we can control their disease with the surgery, but it, the distribution is more important. I've had patients where the bowel is almost completely spared, but there's heavy involvement on, on the non-bowel surfaces, and that's usually quite manageable. It's still uh, physical trauma to the patient, and there's still a lot of recovery from extensive peritonectomy and from other organ resection, but, but bowel resection increases the risk of short-term and long-term complications, so that, I think, is probably the most important uh, uh, factor to consider. Losing a gallbladder, losing a spleen, ovaries, these may have some implications, but not nearly the implications of the bowel. I think when we think about two of the things that are most prognostic for cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC, PCI is one of them, but so is completeness of cytoreduction. And if even with, this, with extensive disease, if we think we can get everything down to 2.5 millimeters or less, which is a completeness of cytoreduction score of one, you know, removing all visible disease is zero. But if we can get down to a CC1, the long-term outcomes are pretty similar, and we can still provide quite a benefit. And that's also going to make a difference as far as how we approach organ resection. So if it's going to be the difference between a CC0 and a CC1, I'll be more aggressive. But if somebody has extensive disease, but it's all small volume, and it's still within that CC1 range, then we might say we're going to hold off a little bit for right now. And I would actually look at it in a different way. For younger patients, our treatments are getting better. And what I also don't want to do with my surgery is overstate the benefit and then compromise that patient's ability to go on to some subsequent treatment because they have relative shortcut syndrome or have a complication or some other reason that I have then taken a treatment option away. And so a lot of it is balancing what is going to be the benefit of the surgery versus what is going to be the cost, not just in the perioperative phase but also in the long term. We don't want to plan our second operation with our first operation and say we're going to come back and do this again but leaving that option open some patients do undergo two or three or hypex over their lifetime um, and so i think that's where that one or two hour discussion also lands and i think that also is so important to be guided by a laparoscopy to really see what is the distribution and the morphology of the disease, and what do we think we can technically achieve, and how do we balance those goals? So I think that's a nice segue into this, this sort of next com comment, which is, say, you look inside and you see there's extensive disease, and Dr. Offen and Dr. Marmarless, they do some magic, and, you know, things are working, and we'll talk about that magic in a minute. Um, and then you go back and you do another laparoscopy, and there's still pretty high burden disease on the bowel. You, you still feel like you cannot clear... Uh, this disease, the patient is young, motivated, goals are uh, to live longer. At what point do you ever consider surgery in this setting where you know you might not have a complete side reduction or do you never offer this person surgery? I think so, a part of that question or part of that answer is going to be formulated by the symptoms. So if we're running into somebody who has abdominal pain, um, a lot of ascites that's refractory to treatment, those can be reasons and, and those can be symptoms that we can treat with the surgery and potentially improve. Um, but there are certain situations and so I think again it goes back to being individualized and I think part of it is the extent of the site reduction. It's pretty low risk for patients to have their what we call the parietal peritoneum or the peritoneum on the underside of the abdominal wall, um, down in the pelvis, under the diaphragms. For that to be stripped, I think that, you know, uh, that can still provide quite a bit of benefit, but it really depends on what the patient's coming in with as far as symptoms. Yeah, I mean, I think the general rule is if you can't get them down 
to minimal residual or CC1 or CC0, the, the role of surgery is much more limited and, and needs to be very targeted and, and there, you know, the, the concept of just decreasing the amount of cancer surgically doesn't really seem to have value. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're leaving, uh, uh, you know, a lot of disease around the bowel, how much value is there stripping the disease the, off the diaphragm? I, I, I'm fairly skeptical that it matters that much, unless there's symptoms. Like I had one guy who had chronic hiccups from diaphragm disease, and we cleared his diaphragm and his hiccups stopped, and he was just hiccuping 24-7 until then, so he was extremely happy that his hiccups went away. Uh, but we, didn't, we couldn't clear all his disease, but we served a purpose with the surgery. Uh, other examples are people losing weight, their appetites decrease because they're evolving into a, a, a focal bowel obstruction, not global bowel failure, but an area of bowel that's narrowed or kinked that you can address um, uh, in order to, um, uh, you know, allow them to eat better. So I think when you can't achieve an optimal set of reduction, then I think it's up to you to figure out what can I achieve and, and have a very frank discussion with the patient and their support group as to, you know, what are their goals. And, you know, in my mind, like, for example, I would have never thought if someone said, can you do surgery for my hiccups? I would have laughed probably initially. But, you know, this guy, it changed his life for a year. He stopped hiccuping. Um, so um, so for, for him, it was hugely important to, to do that. Um, probably the best thing we could have done for him. But, you know, those are very much case-by-case -case type situations. I mean, I, I think that the thinking has changed a little bit in peritoneal meso. You know, unlike other diseases, we know from other peritoneal metastases that you absolutely have to remove everything. But there was a study that came out in the late 2000s from a big group, SOGI, in the, one of our important journals, Journal of Clinical Oncology, where they found that even if you had a CC2 cytoreduction, so you heard completeness of cytoreduction, meaning you've removed it down to at least less than 2.5 millimeters thick. Um, but the study found that when it's even 2.5 millimeters to 2.5 centimeters, which is like pretty substantial, like an inch, um, and they got intraperitoneal chemo, these patients actually did better. But then I think over the years, the data has been refined where I think all of us have come to this understanding that that is not acceptable in our patients. And generally, we'd only operate on patients when they're symptomatic or, or there is a focused area of, of need for the patient. So I think that's, that's a key evolution of the way we've thought about cytoreduction in mesothelioma. So I guess um, Dr. Off and Dr. Mamorelis, maybe speak a little bit about in this scenario, how would you approach if it's an epithelioid mesothelioma um, how do you think about whether you would do chemotherapy or immunotherapy in this evidence-free zone uh, of peritoneal mesothelioma? Do you check PDL1 status? Do you look at the, the tumor profiling? How do you kind of decide who gets what? So <clears throat> it's a good question. A lot of it comes down to, again, medical comorbidities, patient preference, what we think may be the safest of the options. Um, to just address PDL1, I'm not sure how familiar people are in the room with that, but it's Basically, they'll take a slide from the biopsy or surgical material. They literally will stain it, and they'll give you a percent, zero to 100 percent. The higher the percent, the higher the PDL1. And in certain tumors, most archetypal being lung cancer, let's say, the higher the percent, the better the chance immune therapy may work. That is not as well vetted in mesothelioma, either in the chest or the belly. So it may sway me one way or another, but. It's not necessarily the defining feature in my practice based on PDL1 alone. Uh, a lot of it has to do with histology. Um, so if a person comes in and they're not resectable, or let's say they see my surgical colleagues and they're borderline resectable, but we need a response first. Um, if it's epithelioid, standard is still to consider chemotherapy technically, but nowadays immunotherapy is also very viable, albeit somewhat data-free. Um, if it was non-epithelioid disease, so biphasic or sarcomatoid, again, as Dr. Marmorella said, I think ex extrapolating from the plural literature, a lot of us would be more prone to give immunotherapy up front. Um, but again, it's a very individualized question. Um, the, the only thing I'll add is I also take into account um, whether there's fluid in the abdomen that's causing a problem. Um, so there's some evidence that adding agents against VEGF like bevacizumab um, can help to reduce some of the fluid that's in the abdomen, and that's often combined with chemotherapy, but 
um, also can be combined with immunotherapy. So that's another consideration in terms of um, uh, you know, the systemic therapy options. Can I ask what other situations you would use uh, BEV in first line as part of your combination? So ascites you mentioned is one. What other scenarios? And what scenarios would you not want to use it in? In a patient without a reason not to give Avastin, and if we did not think surgery was immediately a viable situation where there'd be a concern about potential healing, if I'm going to give chemotherapy and the patient's otherwise physically fit, we think about cisplatin, pemetrexid, also called Olympta, and I would consider Avastin. Um, and that's been a lot of the caveats and discussions in the plural literature from some of the trials where people will say Avastin's not completely standard. It's in the guidelines. It does have benefit for some. Yes, it does have ampl complication, but in my practice, unless you're telling me give them four cycles and I'm hoping to get them to surgery, if I'm going to go for chemo, I would add the Avastin if there was no reason not to. Just for those of you who aren't aware of this, Avastin interferes with wound healing, so you, you, it's a dangerous thing that can be used in the pre-op setting. It can be dangerous. So when we know someone's going to surgery, we generally don't like patients to have Avastin. Plus, you have to be off for eight weeks before surgery. So most of the patients I see aren't on Avastin, which made me curious about how you do decide. Great. I think we'll pause for a minute here, see if there's any questions. We, we do have another case discussion if, uh, if you all are, are up for it. But are there any questions from the floor? We are also a little bit short on time, so um, let's do the non-surgical case study. All right, so since we are, what, what time does the session end? Five minutes? minutes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no pressure. So basically what I'm going to do is just go over a lovely patient of mine that I'm actually seeing Tuesday. Um, I shared with Dr. Nash. Um, so this was a 61, is a 61-year-old uh, woman who presented initially with very vague symptoms, abdominal discomfort, bloating. This was in the very beginning of the pandemic. She, you know, as many people did during the beginning of the pandemic, tried to say it was no big deal, she was fine, waited about you know a year or so um, until things started to get more noticeable, more discomfort, weight loss. She got an ultrasound with her primary care clinician and unfortunately was noted to have a quite large abdominal lesion. Um, she was seen at another very good cancer hospital initially before they knew what the diagnosis was, they were thinking about things like ovarian cancers, gastric cancers, the more common, if you will, belly cancers, but they did the right thing, they biopsied to figure out what it was. And they called this um, on the next slide, an epithelioid peritoneal mesothelioma. And I just put this little snip here of all the fancy terms and words. When we did make the determination of an epithelioid or a non-epithelioid mesothelioma, it depends a lot on the kind of the, how good the biopsy material was, but it also depends on the pathologist. And so these are, this is kind of the nuts and bolts behind the scenes of what we look at, what they look at. It's all these different stains. It's not just visual, but it's also these diagnostic tests and workups that help us figure out and confirm the diagnosis. Um, so before I get going, I guess just uh, onto the next part, I, I guess I'll ask Melina, uh, Dr. Marmorellis, what other, if any, diagnostic test would you want to have sent off concurrently for a new diagnosis? Yeah, so one of the other things we look at is um, KI-67. So um, that's basically a marker of how quickly the cells are turning over, how, how quickly it's growing, the higher the number, the kind of um, more s rapidly it's growing. And so that can give us an idea also about the aggressiveness um, of the tumor. So that's one other thing I look for in pathology. I don't use pdl one so yeah. um, that's not something that I would look for necessarily. The other thing we did do with, uh, in her case, as I mentioned, we offered her somatic and germline testing. At this time, she transitioned her care to our institution just based on geographic preference. Um, her, it came back with a BAP1 and a PBRM1 alteration. So these are tumor genetic alterations. So it's something she was not born with, but something the tumor acquired over time. Um, and the inherited genetic testing was negative. Um, so my next step in management, when I met this you know, lovely 61-year-old fit patient, had some symptoms, pretty bulky disease. We've confirmed the diagnosis. I called Dr. Nash um, and I asked him, you know, what do you think? Um, we looked at the cross-sectional imaging um, and he said maybe it was possible, but it wasn't an upfront uh, consideration. She had a lot of bowel involvement. Mm 
and she would have needed a good response. So I guess uh, I'll turn the question to the panel if anybody wants to comment. So a person that has borderline resectable disease in what we could call the neoadjuvant intent or pre-surgical is the intention setting, um, what would you consider giving this patient? I guess I'll ask the medical oncologist. <laughs> So I, I think the data is probably best for chemotherapy without bevacizumab. Um, so we would, and we do routinely offer a few cycles of chemotherapy to see if we can get um, a good response to get them to surgery. She passed the boards. Um, so um, we gave four cycles of platinum pemetrexid, also called Olympta. Uh, the choice of carboplatin versus cisplatin is very nuanced and can cause some anxiety for patients with mesothelioma. Cisplatin is technically what we would call preferred. Um, there's a slight advantage based on some old literature, but there are different toxicity profiles. And if you need to use carboplatin, it's not really a loss. They're both very good drugs. That decision is individualized to the patient. For her, she had hearing difficulty, and giving her cisplatin could have caused more deafness. So we decided to use carboplatin. Um, so we did interval imaging, um, and we thought there was a nice response, actually. There were some questionable issues in the chest, but we were hoping it was inflammatory. Unfortunately, when she went to the operating room, despite best attempts, there's a lot of fibrosis, so a lot of like um, almost scarring it looked like. Dr. Nash dutifully took biopsies and we looked at it and unfortunately it wasn't just scar, it was a viable disease that had kind of adhered and matted her bowel together, making surgery not a realistic option. So she came back to me with this very unique situation of, on imaging, she wasn't progressing. In fact, she felt better, she had better quality of life, but surgically, she's now high risk for a bowel obstruction and pathologically had viable disease. So then I'm stuck in the situation of what do I do? I've just given her the four doses. We usually don't extend it beyond four initially for the most part. So we decided to go to the other part of our armamentarium and we tried Ipinevo, dual immune therapy, saying she got some response to chemo, but it wasn't enough. Let's try another approach. Um, so we gave her the immune therapy, and unfortunately, she felt much worse on treatment, and I got an early look scan, and there was actually pretty rapid disease growth in the chest. So I'll, I'll approach that, this a, a little bit, but it's a whole different conversation we probably don't have time for about with immune therapy, sometimes you can see disease get bigger, and the question becomes, is it a flare or a pseudo progression, meaning it's getting bigger before it gets smaller, or is it real progression? The unfortunate truth is we see a lot more real progression than fake progression. And the only way to know that is time, but clinically. Like when I saw her, she felt worse, her scan looked worse. That's clinical progression, regardless of what the scan showed. So I knew we had to stop the epinevo. In the meantime, we always explore clinical trials, and I had her seen concurrently with our cellular therapeutic service, and they consented her for CAR-T therapy, a trial we have and many other institutions have um, different designs of. Um, and so she had cells taken and frozen for potential use in the future. So now I have this person who's progressed on immune therapy, didn't technically progress on the chemo, and now she's feeling worse. So what did I do? I had the choice of either a gemcitabine-based regimen. At this point, the cells weren't ready. They take a you know, few months to manufacture, so I couldn't use the CAR-T. So I gave her the chemo I gave her the first time around, because it had been several months. She had benefit from it. Um, and I gave her four more doses, so a total of eight. And again, this is a very nuanced consideration. Her kidneys were fine. She tolerated the first four fine. Not everybody will give or can tolerate this many doses. Um, and she had a beautiful response. Since I knew surgery wasn't an option, as Dr. Nash was just discussing, I gave her the Avastin because at that point, you know, we were kicking for the goal here because we didn't have any other choices in backup. And I'm happy to say, you know, we got her 18 months on Avastin with no symptoms. And I only recently stopped her because she came with hip pain after traveling to Italy, and she had a complication of the Avastin, which is avascular necrosis, because it affects the way the blood vessels form everywhere, including the bone. So I stopped it, and I'm managing her, and I see her Tuesday because we're actually going to have this very nuanced but good conversation of her cells that we harvested two years ago are going to expire because we thought she would need them sooner. And so the question now becomes, does she want to explore this trial now? or let the cells expire because she's doing wonderfully. And so I think this is kind of exemplifies the importance of the, you know, all the kind of treatment modifications we've had, the new developments and disease treatments we have, the interdisciplinary discussions, and a person who's had, knock on wood, a very good outcome from when I met her. So, questions on that? Comments from the group? <laughs> 
Uh, man, I was really hoping that story had a, a good ending, so thank yeah. you. <laughs> so far, so good. Um, I have just sort of a general question, if it's okay to do that at this point. Um, first, I just want to thank everyone on the panel for even caring about peritoneal mesothelioma. It's just so, it's so rare, and the fact that you all are dedicated to finding treatments for it really means a lot to us out in the world. Um, I, so my question is, um, what do you wish like general medical practitioners knew about peritoneal mesothelioma when, when it's a possible diagnosis for someone? You know, considering that it is rare, not a lot of doctors see it, they don't know what to look for. So just what, what do you wish people knew? Well, the easy answer is go to a specialist, send them to a specialist, right? Because there's no way a person in primary care could really understand how to manage this condition as probably everyone in this room is aware, they get overwhelmed, right? So I think the key is, you know, reaching out to an organization like MARF or to, um, uh, you know, a cancer center where there's, they have a track record of treating the disease and, and then, you know, be there to support the patient. One of the problems sometimes we have, because patients come from a distance for care, because just the, the nature, it's a big country and there's, you know, sent many centers who treat this, but not that many. So we need the primary care to stay involved with the rest of their medical management, because obviously we're very focused on, you know, this disease treatment, their cancer care but they still have high blood pressure and diabetes or whatever else going on. So sometimes we have this complete disengagement of the primary care physicians because they're afraid uh, to, you know, that they're gonna mess something up. Uh, but, you know, we don't have good primary care physicians at Memorial Sloan Kettering. I mean, we all do our best, but, um, you know, in most of the major cancer centers, they're not focused on that. So I think it's important that the primary physician stays engaged, you know, is there to help the patient in many other aspects of their care and their life, and then stay in communication with the specialist as well. Uh, but, but I think that's, you know, because otherwise there's just far too much they would have to possibly absorb otherwise. And I, I could, just two points I would say, it's not plural. Um, and so understanding there are similarities, but there are important differences, and the disease management teams are slightly different, obviously. They bring different surgical expertise and medical expertise, and the importance of the proper initial diagnostic workup. That includes genetic testing, proper pathologic assessments, good cross-sectional imaging. And in the community, no one's ever gonna suspect it's peritoneal mesothelioma, right? It's not the most common thing, and so it's never wrong to get a biopsy, and once you get tissue, uh, you know, knowing then when to send to, uh, you know, actually a pathologist it really needs to be reviewed at a center that has pathologists that have seen this before as well. And I think just to add to all of that, you know, one thing that I think is very important is to make sure that they're not nihilistic or prognosticating the patient before knowing what it is or sending them to the specialist. And I think that is unfortunately a big part of, of this disease. You know, when you look at national data, 60% of patients with peritoneal mesothelioma never make it to a specialist. So it's a rare disease, but off the rare, you know, what we're talking about are, are those patients that made it to see us. But what about all those that never made it to see us? So I think that's the big part where primary care physicians make a big role. And I think this is not ready for prime time, but many of you might have heard this already. The, you know, tests like the MCED test, the liquid biopsy test, is, was just published in Lancet a couple of weeks ago as a test, as a uh, liquid biopsy for identifying cancer in a primary care-ish type setting. So there will be an opportunity, hopefully in the next few years, where, where you, know, you can get a blood test on your annual physical and your primary care might be the one finding these sorts of you know, even rare conditions. Thank you so much. Uh, we are, thank you, we appreciate it. 